And this will be joint work with Jack Heisinger when it comes to rational surfaces and Howard Neuer and Kota Yoshioka when it comes to K3 surfaces. So the basic setup is like this. So we'll start, we'll start with the smooth projective surface. So over the complex numbers. Um, and there will be an ample divisor on that. And then we want to understand moduli spaces of sheaves on these surfaces. So what does that mean? So let me introduce the basic objects. So, it, so if you have a coherent pure dimensional sheaf, then you can look at this Hilbert polynomial. And if the dimension of the sheaf is D, then the Hilbert polynomial will look like this. It will have some constant times m to the d over d factorial plus, so here m means m age, of course, we fix this ample, plus lower order terms. So then you define the reduced Hilbert polynomial, which is the Hilbert polynomial divided by this coefficient over here. And this allows you to measure, to have a measure of stability. So now why do you need a measure of stability? The problem is that if you want to find the moduli space of sheaves on, even on the curve, right? Then, you know, that's not the bounded problem. You need to impose some conditions. You can't take all coherent sheaves. So for a simple example, say that even if you're on P1, right? If you want vector bundles of rank two and degree zero, you have things like O of minus N plus O of N. And that's not really a bounded problem. So what you need to do is impose a stability condition. And the traditional one is Giesecker stability. And then what you do is, um, so, you know, <clears throat> all right, so I'll define that. So maybe let me introduce some, some notation. So, you know, if you have a torsion free sheaf, you call the slope or the total slope as C1 of the sheaf divided by the rank and the H slope, the slope with respect to this ample as C1 dot H divided by the rank. And then, you know, the discriminant is also a useful in, invariant which, uh, which is just this, it's given by this formula. It doesn't matter too much what it is, but it's just another way of packaging the churn character of this sheet. All right, so then let's talk about what it means to be semi-stable. So we will say that the sheaf is semi-stable if it's first of all pure uh, of dimension D, and it has the property that for any subsheaf, the reduced Hilbert polynomial that we just introduced is less than or equal to the reduced Hilbert polynomial of the sheet. So in particular, what that means is that, um, um, <clears throat> what, what, what this means is that you ask that these polynomials are like this, if M is uh, greater than or equal to much greater than zero for large enough M. So in particular, if you go back to, um, to this formula, you know, if you have a, if you're in a surface and you have torsion free sheaf, right, then, then this looks like a 2 m square over two, plus there is a linear term, you know, let's call it a 1 m, plus there is a constant, right? So since you're dividing by this term, right, then what you are saying is that, you know, this a 1 over a 2, which actually can be viewed as, um, as the h slope, right? So, so first you're asking that the sheaf be H semi-stable and in case of equality of slopes, you know, if you have a subsheaf with the same slope, then you want to break ties with the constant term of the polynomial, all right? Now, the nice thing about this is that, you know, there are projective moduli spaces parameterizing these sheaves. And then there is a little bit of a subtlety, which I'm not going to dwell on much here, is that, you know, you call two semi-stable sheaves S equivalent if they have the same jordan holder filtration. Um, and then this moduli space doesn't quite parameterize isomorphism classes of sheaves, it just parameterizes S equivalence classes of HG sticker semi-stable sheaves. But we're not going to worry about this kind of distinction. And, you know, these projective moduli spaces exist for any variety. So, you know, it's a way of associating to any smooth projective variety an infinite sequence of moduli spaces that carry a lot of information about the original variety. All right, so now what are the kinds of questions that you, you see when you see this moduli spaces? 
So first of all, if these marginalized spaces are fairly well understood on curves, but already on surfaces, there are lots of questions that we don't know how to answer. The basic ones are when are they non-empty? What is their dimension? How many irreducible components do they have? Like all of these problems are open in general. <clears throat> and there are two types of answers to these questions. One is if uh, you know, the surface is really special, like if X is P2 or X is a K3 surface, then there are good answers to these questions. We understand when these modular spaces are non-empty. We understand their topology. We understand their irreducibility and so on and so forth, right? Um, but for a general surface, we, these questions are open. And the other kind of theorems that there are is that if you ask that the discriminant be very large. So first of all, there is Bogomolov inequality, which says that, so Bogomolov, which says that these modular sp spaces are empty unless delta is positive, non-negative, okay? And then they behave better and better if the discriminant gets large. And remember that this discriminant was some invariant that, that um, encodes the second churn character. So if you want, if the second churn character goes to minus infinity, then these moduli spaces start behaving better. They become irreducible of the expected dimension and so on and so forth, okay? But underlying a lot of these questions is a basic problem of brill noether theory. And it says the following. So, you know, what is the cohomology? So if I have this moduli space and I take a general sheaf in this moduli space, what you want to know is what is the cohomology of this sheaf? Like what are the, what are the com what's the cohomology of this sheet? All right, so in other words, and then, you know, you can soup this up. So the first question you can ask, what's the generic behavior of a sheep in this moduli space? And uh, once you've done that, the next question you can ask is, if there is unexpected cohomology, then what does that look like? In what dimension does it jump? Like how can it jump and so on and so forth? All right, so, so a few remarks. These kinds of things asymptotically you can understand. As I said, if the discriminant is really large, right? Then by a theorem of O'Grady, these moduli spaces are irreducible. And if this discriminant is really, really large, then the Euler characteristic is negative. So one consequence of that is that eventually what happens is that all sheaves have only age one and nothing else, okay? If the discriminant is really, really large. The other thing that you can understand, if the slope is very ample, that, then of course you, by ser vanishing type theorems, then H1 and H2 vanish and you only have H0 and that's equal to the Euler characteristic. So those are two of the sort of basic um, asymptotic statements, but you know, the interesting question is like finding good bounds on these statements, you know? not just some ser vanishing kind of statement, but actually having an explicit um, bound for after which the cohomology becomes simple. All right. And then, you know, the dream situation really happens for P2. So let me tell you the theorem. So this is a theorem from the early 80s due to Goethe and Hirschowitz, and it says the following thing. Suppose you look at P2. So now I take my X to be P2. So that's a case where the moduli spaces really behave well, right? And let me assume that the moduli space, the, the, the rank is at least two, okay? Then it says that the general sheaf has at most one non-zero cohomology, okay? So what that means, um, what that means is that um, in particular, you see completely numerically, you can determine the cohomology of the general sheaf in the moduli space. So for instance, the first thing is that the Euler characteristic is negative, right? Then that means that there has to be H1, so there can't be any H0 or H2, and the dimension of H1 has to be minus the Euler characteristic. If the, honestly, there's some chat. Oh. Um, yeah, that is true. There is some problem with my, let me see whether I can get, um, I don't know what happened. Uh, uh, let me see, I can't hear what you're saying. So let me see. 
Um, I don't know what the problem is. Um, okay, if you have a question, please write in the chat. I'll follow it on the chat. Um, all right. So, so as I was saying, you know, this theorem tells you numerically what the sheaf, what the cohomology of a stable sheaf on P two is. If the Euler characteristic is negative, you can only have H one. If the Euler characteristic is positive, of course, you can only have H not or H two. But then you need to decide which one. And how do you decide that? You decide by the slope. If the slope is positive, right, then you cannot have H2. You have to have H0. And if the slope is negative, you cannot have H0. So you have to have H2. So the sign of the Euler characteristic together with the sign of the slope completely determines the cohomology of the general sheet. And you see in the theorem, there is this, uh, this assumption that the rank has to be at least two because this is false for rank one. So let me give you a quick example. So if you take the ideal sheaf of a single point and twist that by minus three, okay? So the point here is that O of minus three on P2 has H2, has one dimensional H2. The H2 of the sheaf is isomorphic to C, okay? And it doesn't have age not or age one. So if you if you twist this thing by the ideal sheaf, then you see that the Euler characteristic becomes zero. And of course, this preserves age two. So then that means that this also has one dimensional age one. So this is a case where age one and age two are both one dimensional. And this is the general sheaf. I mean, when you have a rank one sheaf on the surface, then it has to look like a line bundle tensor and ideal sheaf. And then you know you can tell what the line bundle and the number of points are just from the numerical invariance. So this is the only the general member of this moduli space, and you see that there are two non-zero cohomology groups. Okay, the reason for this is that here ser duality fails, right? Like this is not locally free, not locally free. A fact about moduli spaces of sheaves in P two is that. The moment the rank is at least two, then the general member is locally free, so you can use ser duality. <clears throat> so let's let me maybe briefly sh sh sketch the idea of the proof. So how does it go? So you see, you work instead with um, you don't work with stable sheaves. The one thing that's hard in life is that it's hard to check the sheaves are stable, and it's hard to sort of produce stable sheaves. I mean, even though they are all over the place, you know, proving any specific sheaf is stable is usually hard. So you work with something simpler. You call something called prioritary sheaves. So what's a prioritary sheaves? Sheaf, a prioritary sheaf is a sheaf where x2 of v and v minus one is zero. The way you should think about it is that the restriction, you have a map from v to v restricted to a line, right? And you want this map, the restriction to the general line to be like, you want the induced map on moduli spaces. So, you know, I have the moduli spaces on P2 of these Vs, and I have the moduli space on P1 of these V restricted to Ls. You want this map to be surjective. And if you write that condition, like if you think about what the condition means, it boils down to some condition like this. Okay. Now, the nice thing is that semi-stable sheaves are priority, okay? So that's because, you know, if I had a semi-stable sheaf, then X2 VV minus one is by CR duality, harm VV minus two. And you see that the slope of this is smaller than the slope of that, right? So there cannot be any homomorphisms this way. So that this is zero, so that you see that the semi-stable sheaf is priority. The next important fact is that the stack of prioritary sheaves on a birationally ruled surface is irreducible. So if X is birationally ruled, so that means that if you can map to a curve birationally with fiber as a curve, right? Generic fiber at P1, that then you know if you have such a say it again. Oh. Oops. All right. All right. So, so um, if X is but sorry about that. If X is birationally ruled, then what happens is that for a surface like that, uh, 
F prioritary sheaves, like sheaves that are prioritary with respect to a fiber are irreducible. So in particular, you see P2 is such a surface. If you blow up P2 at the point, right? Then, you know, here is the lines that pass through it. So this is really, you know, there's a map to P1 with fibers, these lines, right? Then you see that this is a, such a surface. And so the stack of priority sheaves is irreducible. So now what does that mean? So you see, you have this irreducible stack in there, you have this open set of semi-stable sheaves. So if you want to prove some sort of cohomology vanishing of the form that, uh, you know, Goethe and Hirschowitz is telling us, then what you need to do is you need to, uh, ex it's enough to exhibit one sheaf. And now it's easy to do it. The reason why priority sheaves are easy is that you can write down something like this, O of A to some power plus O of A, so this is the direct sum. So, you know, some, some number of copies of O of A and some number of copies of O of A plus one. This kind of thing is of course not semi-stable unless one of the factors is one of S or R minus S is zero. But the nice thing is that something like this is still priority. And it's not hard to check that X2 VV minus one is zero. And so in particular, you see that I can write something like this and you know, some, and then you see by Sarah duality, we can also assume that the slope is at least minus three halves. Right, because the canonical of P2 is O of minus three, right? So, you know, there is a symmetry around the line minus three house. So by say our duality, we might as well assume that it's greater than or equal to minus three house, right? So then you see, I can make a sheaf of any slope <clears throat> by writing O of A to some power plus O of A plus one to some power. And then if I want the slope to be bigger than or equal to minus three halves, that means that A has to be bigger than or equal to minus two. So in particular on P2 sheaves like this have no higher cohomology, okay? And then, you know, there is a check that you can do. The check that you can do is that the discriminant of a sheaf like this is less than or equal to zero, okay? They are not stable so that we knew, yeah? But in particular, the discriminant less than or equal to zero. So now in order to construct a priority sheaf of any invariant, right, with discriminant greater than or equal to zero, all you need to do is you look at elementary modifications. So what's an elementary modification? You take a general point P and a general map from V to OP. So this is a general point. This is a general map, okay? And then this is called the elementary modification of V along P. But of course, you know, it depends on the particular map you take, right? <clears throat> and then, um, you know, what, what happens is that now what it does is that this increases the discriminant. So the discriminant of V prime is the discriminant of V plus one over R, where R is the rank, right? And it has the property that it preserves being prioritary and it preserves the fact that if V has only one non-zero cohomology group, then V prime only has a non one non-zero cohomology group. So this way you can actually explicitly construct a priority sheaf of any invariant that has only at most one non-zero cohomology group. So, you know, this is sort of a satisfying picture in that, you know, you can by hand write it down, okay? And so that's the theorem of Goethe and Hirschowitz. And it says that on P2, you have a dream situation, right? So maybe let me put it like this. So, so you know, <clears throat> we can say that weak Brill Noether holds if in your moduli space, there exists a sheaf with at most one non-zero cohomology, right? So, you know, typically, you know, the Euler characteristic tells you that, you know, as long as the Euler characteristic is non-zero, right? Then some cohomology group has to be non-zero, but so this is saying that, you know, at most one of them is non-zero. Right? In particular, if the Euler characteristic is zero, then you get that all the cohomology vanishes, okay? And this is the dream situation when this weak will know their holes, okay? And as I said, P2 is the dream situation, so weak will know their holes for all moduli spaces of bundles. Here, of course, you can say, what about rank one? You know, in rank one, where it doesn't hold, they are not bundles, right? They are ideal sheaves of points. So they are not locally free. Okay, 
So that's the dream situation. But of course, you, the next question is what happens on other surfaces? All right, so already you see when the surface has a curve of negative self-intersection, the picture gets more complicated. So let, let, let's do an example. Suppose that you look at the Hirzebruch surfaces. So what's the Hirzebruch surface? Hirzebruch surface is like, um, <clears throat> you know, the projectivization of O plus O of E, right? So E here is an integer, we can take it to be positive. E here is a non-negative integer, let's say it like that, right? So in particular, the examples you should take in mind, um, if E is zero, then this is just P1 cross P1. If E is one, this is just the blow up of P2 at the point, okay? So those are the examples you should keep in mind. And, you know, what it does is that this is a ruled surface over P1, they are precisely together with P2, these are the minimal surfaces with the exception E equals one. They are the minimal rational surfaces, okay? Um, so, so the way you should think about it, this is some surface with P1 fibers mapping to P1. And then, you know, there's some distinguished section E, right? And with the property that the self-intersection of that distinguished section is minus E. And then, you know, you can write out the whole um, cohomology ring or, you know, chow ring of the surface, you know, the interesting intersection numbers are E squares minus E, E dot F, so F is the fiber, E is the section is one, and F square is zero. So now the interesting thing here, of course, is that if you compute the Euler characteristic of E, O of E, it's two minus E. So in particular, you see if E is sufficiently large, right, for instance, if E is at least two, right, then this Euler characteristic is less than or equal to zero. So, you know, you would own, like, you know, if weak real node are held, right, you would say that there's only H1 or there is no cohomology or something like this. But, you know, this O of E, this section is an effective curve. So this O of E always has a section. Even though, you know, the Euler characteristic is less than or equal to zero, we don't expect I mean, so, you know, if you just went by the numerics, you wouldn't expect there to be any age not, but, you know, this E is effective, you know? All right. So more generally, of course, it can happen is that you have the Euler characteristic of a sheaf twisted by this special curve is less than or equal to zero, but the Euler characteristic of F is bigger than zero. So that, you know, if the Euler characteristic of F is bigger than zero, typically, and, you know, the, the, the class is, you know, the slope is sufficiently ample, you expect this to be, to have age naught, right? And then, uh, you know, on the other hand, if you twist it by E, the Euler characteristic becomes say less than or equal to zero, then now you don't expect it to have age naught, but you know, that's nonsense, right? Because I have the exact sequence F mapping to F twisted by E, mapping to F restricted to E, right? So age naught of F sits in age naught of F E. Right? So if this guy is positive dimensional, then so must this be. So you see that this is an obstruction for weak real node to hold. And then, you know, anytime a surface has negative self intersection curve on it, this is an obstruction, right? And the nice thing is that the theorem is like this if you are on a Hertzebruch surface, this is the only obstruction. That means that, you know, as long as, um, as long as you know the behavior with respect to this E is okay, then we will know their holes. So now let me briefly tell you what the theorem is. <clears throat> Again, the details don't matter too much, but uh, so you know the theorem is like this: that if I have a general sheaf in my moduli space on this Hertzsch surface, the first thing is that you. <clears throat> And again, I should, uh, no, nah, it's okay. So if F dot mu is greater than or equal to minus one. So if you dot your slope with F and you get something bigger than or equal to minus one, then you can't have H2. And if it's less than or equal to minus one, then you can't have H naught, okay? In particular, if you're equal to minus one, then you don't have H naught and you don't have H2 and weak real no other holds. In that case, you can only have age one and the size of the age one is minus the Euler characteristic. All right, so by Sayer duality, again, let's assume that F dot mu is bigger than minus one, okay? 
So now it depends on the intersection of the slope with the E. If it's bigger than or equal to minus one, then F, then weak Brill Noether holds. Then F has a most one non-zero cohomology group. The problem happens if this intersection is less than minus one. If it's less than minus one, then you see what happens here is that H naught of F minus E is the same as H naught of F. <clears throat> but you know, and then this completely determines all the cohomology if you want, because uh, you know, you can peel off these E's until you either satisfy this condition or one of these two conditions. So you can keep peeling off this E to compute the cohomology. Anyway, you can say it in such a way that it looks neater, but this is the main idea. All right. So in particular, this computes for you the cohomology of the general sheep on any moduli space on the Hertzsberg surface. So the kind of question that you can ask, okay, what are applications of these kinds of things? I mean, you know, for instance, each time you have such a characterization of weak brill noether, you can also characterize Ulrich bundles on the surface, at least semi-stable Ulrich bundles, yeah? So Ulrich bundles are bundles with the property that you know, they have the minimal amount of cohomology, yeah? But if you know exactly what the cohomology of these moduli spaces look like, yeah? That, that you know, that allows you to classify what these things are. So that's one kind of application you can get. Um, there are like several other types of applications. There were, for instance, conjectures of uh, Eisenbahn and Schreier on P1 cross P1, right? Which said that, you know, you can find the sheaf of with any given invariant such that, um, you know, if you twist by any line bundle, then it has at most one non-zero cohomology group. That kind of thing immediately follows from this kind of description. Yeah? In fact, for the general priority sheaf with non-negative with, with non discriminant uh, statement is true. Um, and rank at least two. Um, the other thing that you can say is you can classify moduli spaces whose general member is globally generated, okay? And then, you know, these kind of theorems are also crucial in construction of brill noether divisors. So in what's a brill noether divisor? So brill noether divisor is like this. So say that you have two churn characters, B and W, okay? Let me assume that the Euler characteristic of B tensor W is zero. Okay, so like what's an example of this thing? Say that you're on P2 and say that you have three points. You know, so I'm looking at the Hilbert scheme of three points on P2, right? And then, you know, the kind of question that you can ask, what's the most special position of these three points? And then of course, you know, everybody knows this, that the most special position of three points is that they can be collinear, right? Typically three points are not collinear and something that's special that can happen, like, you know, co-dimension one special condition that can happen is that they can be collinear. So then what this means is that like this, so, so this corresponds to brill noether divisor, and how do you think about it? You see, if I look at IZ, Z is my three points, if I look at IZ of one, right, the Euler characteristic of that is zero, okay? And then the brill noether divisor is the locus where the cohomology doesn't vanish. Yeah, typically the cohomology is everywhere zero, H not H one and H two of I zero of one is zero. Of course, when the three points are collinear, then H not and H one both jump by one. Okay, so in general, it's like this. So if you have two churn characters V and W with Euler characteristic equal to zero, then you know you can take a sheaf. A, a sheaf in the moduli space W, right? And that defines for you a divisor or a virtual divisor in the moduli space V, right? And what is this? This is the set of E, so maybe I should make it curly because we have other things, or maybe let's call it V. Um, so this is the set of V such that age I of V tensor F, this age of V tensor F is not equal to V. So there's some non-zero cohomology. And typically, you know, if you're on a surface, this is either H naught will jump in together with H1 will jump, or H2 will jump in together with H1 will jump, okay? Um, and, you know, there are lots of interesting questions about when these things are 
actually divisors because you know the problem is that you can define this but it doesn't automatically make it a divisor right because you expect it to be a divisor but you can find the examples where no matter what v you take this cohomology is non-zero the fact if you have a weak brill noether type statement right then the advantage is that you know the sum cohomology maybe doesn't vanish right and so, so if the you know the brill noether type statements allow you to say that the cohomology vanishes for some of the v's and if that happens then you get actually an effect of the last so these kinds of things play a role in um uh, in the birational geometry of these moduli spaces, especially in constructing these real nodal divisors. And finally, you know, you can ask questions like, can you characterize ample stable bundles on surfaces? And, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing, um, you know, uh, again, you can use these things to at least make progress on those problems. So now what I want to do maybe in the next, for the next 15, 20 minutes. So this was what happens on rational. So, and I should say, I mean, you know, I'm sort of giving you the sort of basic theorems, but you know, you can extend this theorem to arbitrary rational surfaces. The problem is that, you know, the more points you blow up on the minimal surface, then, you know, the, the, um, the Picard group of these surfaces get more and more complicated. And as they get more complicated, um, you know, the problem that you run into is that we don't even understand the cohomology of line bundles on those surfaces. So already if you blow up P2 at 10 points, 10 general points, very general points, we don't know what the com what we don't know what the cohomology of line bundles on that surface look like. And yeah, you know, of course, we know a lot about it, but it's not the it's not the complete answer. So you know, so so you know, something, if you don't know the answer for line bundles, then you shouldn't expect that you'll know it for higher rank bundles either. But, you know, the same kinds of theorems that asymptotic theorems that are available can be transported to higher rank. Um, namely, you know, if you are sufficiently ample, then you know the cohomology of the line bundle. And similarly, if your slope is sufficiently ample, then you can, you, you can prove the weak real northern holes in the rational surfaces case. But anyway, I'm not going to say much more about the rational surfaces. Maybe just, you know, in the next 15, 20 minutes, let me tell you a little bit about K3 surfaces, what's known there and what kinds of techniques you use for those. So now if you go to K3 surfaces, the, so let me remind you what a K3 surface is. So a K3 surface is a simply connected surface with trivial canonical bundle. You know, if you want an example, think of quartic surfaces, quartic surfaces in P3, or maybe a double cover of P2 branch, the longest sextic or something like this, you know, so, something like this. U square equals F, X, Y, Z, where this is a sextic polynomial. <clears throat> okay, so those are some basic examples. The new feature when you go to K3 surfaces, so I'm going to talk about a K3 surface of Picard rank one in general. So now these don't have any my negative curves. Of course, K3 surface of higher rank can have smooth rational curves, which then have self-intersection minus two. And sort of the kind of problems that come up uh, that we already talked about come up there too. But I want to concentrate on the case of Picard rank one K3 surfaces so that you don't have these uh, negative self intersections curves in there, right? Um, but the new feature here is that you, you have your, your sheaf O of X has both H naught and H2. Now you see the other kind of complication that can happen is that the H2 on in the structure sheaf can start giving unexpected cohomology on some moduli spaces. So let me give you some examples because some of these things are fun, right? So um, all right, say that I have a K3 surface, it's Picard rank is one, and then the generator is H and the generator of the Picard group is H and the square is 2N. Like for instance, on the quartic surface, so you know, on the very general quartic surface would be something like this, and would be two there, so that h square is the degree, which is four. Okay. 
All right, so here is the example that you can do. So the first thing that you can think about is that, you know, this x then embeds in um, pn plus one. Uh, embeds in pn plus one, at least if n is at least two. If n is one, it's just the map from x to p2 of degree two to one map, okay? So that case is a little bit, n equals one case is not quite embedded, it's a two to one map. But as soon as n is at least two, then you get a map to, you know, the typical such situation, x will embed in pn plus one. And then of course you can take the tangent bundle of pn plus one and restrict it to x. And I claim that this gives a very special uh, stable bundle on, on, uh, on the surface. So it has a resolution of this form. You have O mapping to OH n plus two and this F. And then, you know, the way you should think about this is of course, this is the restriction of the um, Euler sequence to X. So the tangent bundle of PN plus one has an Euler sequence that is given by O of one to the N plus two mapping to the tangent bundle, right? So if you were to restrict that or pull that back to X, then you would get the exact sequence like this. And then I claim that this is a stable bundle and it's called what's called a spherical bundle. Now, what that means is that the oil, the, the, to say that the spherical, maybe one way of saying it is that the moduli space is just a single point. Yeah, it's a very special bundle, okay? It's the unique point in this, in this moduli space. And let's compute the cohomology. You know, we have a pretty, pretty, explicit resolution of this sheaf so we can compute this cohomology. And you see that age naught, you know, you have a map, age one of O is zero in a K3 surface. So this age naught maps to this age naught maps to age naught of F. From there, you get that this is CN plus two square minus one. But you see the age one of F, right, is isomorphic to the age two of O. And this is not zero, this is one dimension. So Say that's one dimensional. So there you see that this sheaf has both age one and it has age naught. And since it's the unique point, the moduli space, right? Then, uh, you know, the general sheaf in that moduli space doesn't have weak real node. Okay. And now you can soup this kind of example up into these arithmetic sequences. So, you know, I think that all math talks should have at least one mention of Fibonacci numbers. So let's mention the Fibonacci numbers. So you can do the spherical transforms of these things, whatever that means, right? More explicitly what you do is, so this will be on the K3 surface that's degree two, but you can do a similar thing on any K3 surface, but let's just say in that case, and the reason why I'm saying this one is because this one is where the Fibonacci numbers occur. In general, there are other such sequences of numbers, arithmetic sequences that appear. Um, but um, so, so what happens is that look at, uh, so, so my Fibonacci numbers will be F1 will be one, F2 will be one, F3 will be two and so on and so forth. That's my indexing. So now what you do is you look at the 2K minus two Fibonacci number O to that power mapping to OH to F 2K Fibonacci number and you have a sheaf F here, okay? Um, and I guess I probably need K at least, K at least two or something like this. So that this makes sense. All right, so in particular, if you make K equals two, you recover the previous example. So the one, O mapping to O of three mapping to this thing, yeah. Um, and again, what you get, this F is again, what's a spherical bundle and it's the unique element of its moduli space. It's stable and so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> and you know, the point is that the H2 and O give you a lot of H1 and F so in particular, you can see that age not of F is, I guess I could have written this thing as twice F two K. So I guess this is two F two K plus F two K minus one as well. And however one you want to say it. And age one is given by this Fibonacci number. So in particular, you see neither age not nor age one is zero. And then, you know, you have an infinite sequence of such examples. And, you know, 
you might say that you've been giving us only spherical bundles and is that I mean, may, maybe you just need to worry about spherical bundles. That's not the case. You have to worry about a lot more. So here is a mod. Here is another infinite sequence of moduli spaces that you know, with with these kinds of Mukai vectors, so to speak. So you know, this is another way of. So so you know, you you can give other infinite sequences of moduli spaces which have the property that you know. They have both age not and age one. Typically, if you arrange these n, k, i, and r to be correct, so that they look like this, yeah. And basically, what happens here is that you know you look at uh, you look at maps, you look at you look at extensions of um, of a line bundle on a curve on the k three by some line bundle on the k three to the rth power. And by looking at these kinds of moduli spaces, you can show that this looks like the general point of the moduli space. And if this line bundle has age one, then it follows that the, this sheaf will have age one. Okay, so you can make infinitely many examples like this. All right, so this is just telling you that weak Brill Noether, even for really simple surfaces like K trees of Picard rank one, is not true in general. But then the question that comes up, like, okay, I mean, how much is true and how do you study it? All right, so now let me maybe briefly tell you the setup here. <clears throat> so, you know, so we have a K3 surface of Picard rank one. Typically, you, you, you keep track of your moduli spaces by what's called the Mukai vector. And that is the churn character times the square root of the Todd class, right? <clears throat> or if you want the Euler characteristic of E is this A plus R. R is the rank, C1 is just the C1. This A is some combination of, you know, the second churn character and so on and so forth. Some packaging with the second churn character. Maybe the easiest way to understand what it is is that the Euler characteristic is given by A plus R, okay? So in particular, there is this pairing on Mukai vectors, right? Which gives you, given by minus the Euler characteristic. So the moduli spaces in the case of K3 surfaces are fairly well understood. This is, uh, you know, due to Mukai and Yoshioka and so on and so forth. We know exactly when these things are non-empty. <clears throat> and, you know, they are, Typically irreducible normal projective varieties, we understand their dimension and stuff like this. Okay, so the, the, the geometry of moduli spaces of sheaves and K3 surfaces is very well studied because, in particular, these give um, examples of holomorphic symplectic manifolds, and they're one of the very few family of such examples. All right. But the question that we want to understand is like, how do we understand the sheaf, the cohomology of a sheaf on the K3 surface? The way you study these kinds of things is by using Fourier Mukai factors. Okay, I'm not going to get too much into what these things are, but very briefly, what you do is you take X cross X you take the diagonal in X cross X. And then what you can do is this has two projections. Call them P and Q, say, right? So then if you have a sheaf on X, what you can do is you can pull the sheaf by P. Then you can tensor it with the ideal sheaf of the diagonal. And then you can push it down. Okay? Now, if you do that, you get the Fourier Mukai transform defined by what's called the kernel I of the diagonal, right? And then you see from this object, you can read out the cohomology of the sheaf. Again, the details don't matter too much. They are not that hard. You just need to think a little bit about the definition of these things. So for instance, if you look at the dual of this Fourier Mukai transform applied to your sheaf, I guess I'm calling it F so instead of D, let's call it F. Um, okay. Um, so, so, you know, if you look at the dual of the Fourier Mukai transform, if that thing is a coherent sheaf, then the higher cohomology vanishes. 
And if it's locally free, then actually the sheaf is globally generated. Okay, so then it boils down to how do you study this Fourier Mukai transform? And the new tool we have to do that is called Bridgeland stability. <clears throat> Again, I don't want to get too much into what Bridgeland stability is or like the definition of Bridgeland stability. So the important thing is like this. So let me just briefly say it. Um, the important thing is like this. The Bridgeland, the, so, so you know, this, there is a space of Bridgeland stability conditions. Space of Bridgeland stability conditions. And it's a complex manifold. But I don't really even care about this complex manifold. What you do is you take a very special slice in there. Okay? And what it is is that there is a, so if you fix a churn character or a Mukai vector in this case, then what happens is that there is a wall and chamber decomposition of this. So I fix something like this. There is a wall and chamber decomposition of the space of risen stability conditions. And the way you should think about it is that each chamber corresponds to a moduli space of Brislin stable objects. So there is a moduli space. Brislin stable objects. And walls correspond basically to changing the moduli space. So that when I go from this chamber to this chamber. Now, you know, some objects become destabilized, some objects might become stable. So the way you do is that you change the moduli space. So if you study moduli spaces of sheaves, right, there is a similar picture. Like if you just, before you pass the Bridgeland, there is a similar picture. So, you know, when I have a moduli space, when we define this, it depended on the ample, right? So you can, Think of this as a sort of souped up version of varying the ample, right? If I change the ample class with which I'm deciding which sheaves are stable, I can change whether a sheaf is stable or not. So as you vary this ample divisor in the ample cone of the surface, what happens is that these moduli spaces start changing. So this is a similar picture. You have these original stability conditions in this wall and chamber structure. And as you move in this wall and chamber structure, what happens is that these moduli spaces change, okay? Now, the nice thing is there is a theorem of Minamide Yanagida Yoshioka that says that there is, so there are two nice things to know. Okay, so before I say, the nice theorem of Minamide Yanagida Yoshioka, I should make a statement that, you know, these wall and chamber structure is pretty well understood on surfaces. They, these walls look like nested semicircles. And then, you know, there's some larger semicircle above which you have just the Giesecker moduli space. These Bridgeland moduli spaces, you know, if you fix some value here and you let, you know, you go very high you know, you go up in this picture, right? Then uh, this is, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, lingo for this kind of thing is called taking the large volume limit. Then in the large volume limit, the moduli space becomes just the Giesecker moduli space. Now, the nice theorem of Minamida Yanagida Yoshioka says that there is some other chamber someplace, yeah? So they, let's say the here maybe, yeah, where the moduli space is isomorphic to another Giesecker moduli space. And the isomorphism is given precisely by the Fourier Mukai transform we are interested in. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay, so then the kind of game that you play is this. So here is the nice chamber given by Minamide, Yanag Minamide Yanagida Yoshioka. Here is the Giesecker moduli. Yeah. So now the goal is to cross all these walls until I get to the nice chamber, right? So then the kind of game that you try to play, okay, so, so if, you, if it happens that a sheaf remains stable throughout this whole process, right? Say that I had some sheaf here and it somehow manages to survive all this wall crossing. Well, then this sheaf is an object here, right? 
And then you see what this is saying is that if I have this sheaf here, then the Fourier Mackay transform applied to that sheaf dual is a sheaf. So what that means is that um, what that means is that then you know by this observation that we have is that the sheaf doesn't have any higher cohomology, and if it's in fact a locally free sheaf, in fact the sheaf is globally generated. Okay, so then the game that you need to play is understand whether a sheaf can survive this wall crossing process. And then, you know, if it doesn't, then such a wall is called totally semi stable and they've been classified by Bayer McCree. And then, you know, if you do play this game, then you get the collection of results on these things as to when the weak Brill Northern property holds. And it says that if you have a K3 surface, then for instance, on the K3 surface Picard rank one with degree two n, h square equal to two n, if n is bigger than or equal to the rank, then we will know their holes. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if n is at least two and the slope is at least r plus one, then Brill know their holes, we will know their holes. Or if the Euler characteristic is less than or equal to r, then we will know their holes. And, and more interestingly, if you fix the rank, right? Then there are only finitely many moduli spaces, X and H, R, D, A, where weak Brill Noether doesn't hold. Now, this is slightly surprising because it's also happening on infinitely many types of surfaces, right? If I had fixed the surface, then it wouldn't be such a sur surprising statement. But the fact that you are varying over infinitely many surfaces is the interesting part there. And more interestingly, you can classify the potential places where these, um, you know, where weak Brill Noether doesn't hold. Like, I mean, even this much of the statement, like, you know, even these kinds of numerics give you, for instance, classifications of all reef bundles on Picard rank one K3s. For instance, you know, there exists an all reef bundle of rank R on a K3 of Picard rank one for the polarization MH if and only if two divides are at. And then uh, <clears throat> the general sheaf in, the, in this moduli space actually is all the course, things like this. But you know, more interestingly, you see, it's a little bit better than what I'm making it do. So, so this is like, this is the basic statement that you get if your sheaf somehow manages this pro to escape this process by remaining stable. But you know, if it hits a wall where it's not stable, then you get a different story in which like this F comes with the canonical resolution. So you can also use that canonical resolution actually to compute the um, cohomology of the general sheaf. And you can really do this. I mean, you know, I wrote down what happens up to rank five here, but you know, I could have written it all the way up to rank, uh, rank 20 if I wanted to. So, um, you know, these are all the possible moduli spaces of rank less than or equal to five where weak Brill Noether doesn't hold. Like, you know, we've already seen things like two, three, five. Um, you know, we've seen two, three, five as an example. But so, you know, you, you can write down all the Mukai vectors and compute the cohomology of the H1 um, explicitly. So let me stop there. So. Thank you for Thank your you. attention. Thank you very much. Um, also, let me write. Um, any questions? I'm assuming the rest can hear me. So please write your questions in the chat box. Right. I can't hear still for some reason. Let, you know, let me try. Let me try from the iPad, maybe I can do that. Uh, now, I guess we can even not hear. Um, um, how about you just um, join via your iPad, not uh, the computer anymore? Yeah. 
Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear. Okay, I can also hear you now. So oh, something great. Something went wrong with the computer. So, sorry about that. No, that's, that's certainly fine. Um, as long as we could communicate. I now yeah. uh, stop recording.